we're taking these last few chapters in the book of Revelation and really plunging into the depths of what heaven looks like, what's going on there, and how dynamic it is. Let me give some preface to this to help us understand heaven. Heaven is not strumming a harp on a cloud and we're in some ethereal state and uh, we're bored out of our minds. It's a continual long church day and, and we just don't know what to do. And that's a misconception made up by cartoonists, obviously. <laughs> that's not what heaven is about. And that's why I want to plunge the depths on these last two chapters because I want to show you how dynamic, how real, how physical it is. And we're going to get into actually what you do and all the different various things that God has planned for us in eternity, it will not be boring. Let me help you understand a few things about heaven. Heaven, when I say is dynamic, means that it changes. It changes location. It changes the structures inside of the heavens because heaven is created. If you go to Genesis 1, it says that God created the heavens, plural, and the earth. Paul mentions that there's three heavens. The three heavens, obviously the atmosphere, the first heaven around our globe is the first heaven. The second heaven is space, where the planets are. That's called heaven, even though we call it space. And then the third heaven is what we commonly understand as heaven, the abode of God. But that's how things were created. So that's why the plural is in the Hebrew in Genesis 1. God created the heavens. God doesn't need heaven. He's quite content even without it. Heaven was created for the angels and us. So it's a place of physicality because it's in this universe that he created. And this is why you see in the text in chapter 21, he says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heavens and the first earth had passed away. The idea is that he's going to recreate the entire cosmos, including the old heaven. Well, what do you mean? Well, there's problems that occurred in heaven that Jesus' blood had to rectify. And if you recall, the fall of Satan happened where? In heaven. Sin had entered into heaven in the abode of God. And obviously Satan was kicked out and him and his demonics are in the second heaven, the uh, space around the universe, and they have access to our earth. But nonetheless, it says in Hebrews 9 that the blood of Christ had to be taken into heaven to cleanse the heavenlies. What human sin entered there? None. Only the sin of Satan and his fall had desecrated the temple of heaven. So in heaven, you have to think of it as a place, a place of physicality. There's mountains in heaven. There's a great high mountain you'll see. This is why when you see in the pagan literature of early Mesopotamia or even as recent as the Greeks, what mountain did the Greeks have? Mount Olympus. And that's a derivative or a corruption of the mountains of heaven. There are mountains in heaven. You'll see it in the text today. The other thing about heaven, the temple of God resides in heaven. And that's the pattern that Moses took and made the tabernacle. He looked at that pattern and copied it, what he saw in heaven. And then now, after Messiah has went back into heaven, into the third abode, that realm, he created what's called the New Jerusalem. So think about this. In Moses' day, in Adam and Eve's day, in David's day, the new Jerusalem, the city, did not exist. Even though the patriarchs knew about a city that was coming, it had not been created until Messiah actually went back. Because he said it in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you. That's future tense. So heaven is dynamic. New things occur there. You'll see, as we saw in the book of Revelation, that things occur in heaven. The martyrs are crying out under the altar, how long, sovereign Lord? So there's elements of time, and it's dynamic. And then what we see here in these last two chapters is God creates a new cosmos, a new universe, creates a new planet Earth, creates a new heaven, and what ends up happening is this third abode, where the new Jerusalem is, actually marries itself to Earth. And what it creates is what we call a cosmic temple, if you will, a cosmic temple that God now dwells, his permanent residency is in the new Jerusalem on planet earth. And that's where our base of operation then becomes. And then the rest of the universe is our playground and the new earth is our playground. And we come and go back and forth to this new holy of holies that's been created. It's a giant holy of holies. We're going to look at it today, but 
It's dynamic, and you have to understand it's physical, it's real. It's a lot different than what we're used to, but there's elements of time. We have to have time because we're created beings. So there's elements of time, there's physicality, we will eat there, we will enjoy fellowship there, and we will serve, we will work for the Lord and do many, many things. Can you imagine a day in heaven, and we'll, we'll get into this, but just imagine this. That you wake up one morning and you go to your assignment, you get your assignment from Messiah, you go out into the universe, do your assignment, maybe it's to explore another planet, maybe it's to develop another thing somewhere in the universe, and then you come back at night, have dinner and fellowship with the Lord, and fellowship the rest of the time, so to speak, with other people. It's like that? Yeah, it's more physical than you really think. A day in the life of heaven would be something akin to that that God would give you exploratory tasks to do, and you come back and forth and get your tasks from him. And so you're not going to be bored. You're going to be doing a lot of things that we can't even conceive of, but he has plans for us. And here's the deal. At the end of the day, what you do here matters for the rest of eternity because, as we'll see, your rewards are eternal, eternal There's passive rewards, and then there's active rewards. The passive ones are automatics because you're a believer. You get that automatically. But the active rewards is what you get by what kind of Christian life you live here today. And it sticks with you for all eternity. So rewards is a big deal. You don't want to have the attitude, honestly, of, well, I'm just glad I made it. No, if you're considered least in the kingdom of heaven you're going to be considered least for the rest of eternity. I don't think you want that stigma on you. And so it's very important that we not only understand that everything we store up is going ahead there, and if we don't store up anything, you won't have anything. And it's kind of, the analogy I would use is is kind of like going to an amusement park or maybe going on some exotic vacation that you like to go to. Let's just say you're going to go to Tahiti. And you're like, all right, someone pays your fare, And you get to go and take the trip to Tahiti and someone paid for your lodging. And so you got airfare and lodging. Great. But you're still going to need more when you're in Tahiti. You're still going to need money to eat. And if you want to do anything fun or any activities there in Tahiti, you will have to have money to be able to do those things. Because it costs money. Yeah. In many, many regards, thinking about a vacation like that is akin to understanding heaven. Some people will get the fare paid for, they'll get to have the lodging, but then when everyone else is riding jet skis, they will be told, I'm sorry, you didn't put any money into your account to ride jet skis, so you're not going to be able to ride the jet ski. Well, I want to go rock climbing over there, they have a great rock, no, you can't do that, I'm sorry, because you didn't store up enough money for that. Well, I, can I go on the water slide? No. No. Well, what can I do? Well, you can walk around the city. Well, that's not fair. Well, no, it was fair because you wasted your life on earth. And if you would have done those things, you would have been able to do more things here in heaven, more authority, more privilege. See, certain people will have the ability to sit down and dine with the Messiah on a daily basis. Some will not. They'll be there. But other people have privileges that other people don't. So even in God's economy, even though you get to heaven by the Messiah... People are rewarded differently for how they live their Christian life. Again, just imagine another scenario of taking a trip to an amusement park, and this is another scenario, and they're saying, all right, you can go to Disneyland, and you got the pass to go in, but I'm sorry, you didn't put up enough credits to ride any rides. I can't ride any rides? No, you can have some popcorn, but that's about it. No corn dog for you. You're not going to get a hamburger at the Space Galaxy place, and you're not going to see the Bear Jamboree if they still have that. But you can walk around and maybe go to Tom Sawyer's Island because that's a walking thing, but you're not going to be able to ride Dumbo. What? So when you start seeing that analogy, whether it's Tahiti or Disneyland, whatever floats your boat, you start realizing, oh, I get the ticket to get in, but then as far as beyond that, what you can do there, it's up to you. And that really brings the weight of responsibility on us as believers of realizing, oh, 
Well, if I want to ride Space Mountain or I want to ride jet skis when I get there, so to speak, and I'm using analogies, I better get on the ball. Yeah, you better. Because when we're all there riding jet skis, say, hey, man, this is fun. I'm going to be waving. Hey, Tim, there you are, man. You're on the beach. And Tim's like, yeah, I know. I didn't put any credits in, man. I'm just joking. But I, we, 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 we josh every once in a while. But you know where I'm going with this. The idea is if you waste your life, you're not going to be given all these privileges. And there's tons of them. A lot of privileges. So you've got to think in heaven in those terms. Okay. So now let's get into the text, and let's get to the theme of the text that we're going to study today. The theme of the text, you can see, is humanity's true desire, and you're going to enter what's called the Kodesh HaKodeshim, the Holy of Holies. This is a massive Holy of Holies. It's patterned off the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. It's patterned off the Temple Holy of Holies. And what was in the Holy of Holies? The presence of God over the Ark of the Covenant. It represented the presence of God. And you know this. A high priest could only go in there one time a year, and he had to go in there with blood, right? And no one else could come, and they tied a rope to his foot, because if he died in there, no one could go in there and get him. So if he died in there, they had a rope tied to him, and they would have the pomegranate bells around his garment, and you can hear him moving. If they stopped hearing him move, then they would pull that rope and pull him out of there. Because he had either had a heart attack or died or something, and they could not go in there after him because of the Holy of Holies and the Shekinah presence, so they would actually pull him out. We don't have any recordings that anyone ever died in there, but they did take precautions for that. So the Kodesh Ha Kodeshim is the Holy of Holies, where the presence of God was. And in this particular text, there's a theme. And humanity's true desire, and last week we looked at our hope, our comfort, and stuff like that. Today, the humanity's desire that you're going to see today is security. Security is the major theme in this particular point of the text. And you're going to see a wall. You're going to see gates. Almost like a fortress. I was reading today, and I thought this was brilliant, and I can't remember the gal who wrote this. But she was talking about immigration. She was talking about open borders and and stuff like that. And she says, for goodness sakes, even heaven has a wall and gates. And she said, hell is borderless. It's the broad road of destruction. And I said, man, that nailed it. You're right. There is a wall in the New Jerusalem that keeps people out. So even heaven has a wall. Heaven it doesn't have gates, no gates where it just everyone comes. That's the broad road of hell. I thought, man, she nailed it. I like that. Well, this issue of security is the common theme that you're going to see in these passages. Okay, so what's the deal? And this is where we bring it down to a personal level. And this is kind of what I want you to think about as we study the text. Security for most Christians is a difficult thing. They've had a lot of things done in their life that has made them scared and particularly those who have lost things or lost people, it messes them up. It scars them. Something bad happened to them where something was taken away, some level of control, something happened to them. And what it ends up happening to them, and they don't see it, it's kind of on a subconscious level, they get afraid. Very afraid of the environment, very afraid of the world, very afraid of hearing what's going on in the world, and they start pulling away. They pull away from people, they pull away from the culture, and they just kind of do a retreat because they're scared. Let me share a story before we go in the text. I knew a Christian lady that was just frightful of the world, just scared of everything, and she She's an older lady, and and I get it, you know, and and she's scared because she's living by herself and stuff like that. But then it turned into almost a paranoia. And you're like, well, well, what do you mean by that? Well, because she was so afraid and she felt she had no security, she put like 15 cameras around her house. She had pit bulls surrounding her house. And she had all this technology to protect her, and she would never leave the house. She only left like during a a small window of time in the morning to go to the store and then race back and stay fortressed in her home and would not come out, would not go to social functions, would not go to dinner or anything, just stay barricaded 
in this silo, this foxhole that she had created while her roving animals protected her along with the electronics and security. And you think, there's nothing wrong with cameras or having watchdogs or not, but it had crossed over to the point where, hey man, where's your faith in the Lord to provide security for you? You're barricaded in your house, afraid of the world, that someone's going to get you, which I'm not saying that doesn't happen, but you've over-exaggerated things. It's one thing to be prepared and have insurance and, and have guns to protect you and dogs to protect you, but it's another thing to where you don't even leave the home. We're not in a war zone. What happened is her fear crossed over into paranoia, and that's no good. Because at that point, she ceased to trust in the Lord for her security. Couldn't get her to church. She wouldn't leave her house for church because she was so afraid of leaving the home. I mean, this is like during, during the day on Sunday morning. And you think, man, if I ever get like that, I need to go see a psychiatrist or a psychologist or something. Yeah, you, you, you're entering into a realm of unreality at that point. But folks, you think that doesn't happen to a lot of people it happens more than you think. And it's happening to Christians who start getting paranoid. And after a while, you think, hey, where's your trust in God? Well, this passage right here is showing us, wait a second. God is our security. He's providing in the future a place of security for us. So we never have to fear someone doing anything bad to us, someone taking something from us. That's the mentality we should gain. Let's look at the text. Let's plunge into it. Verse 9. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues, and this is one of the angels that were involved in the tribulation, came to me and talked with me saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. Now, this is interesting. You have to stay in context. This is not a reference to the church. In context, he's referring to the New Jerusalem, and he's using it metaphorically as the bride of the Messiah. And, and the idea is this, that he's presenting the New Jerusalem with his pride, because this is what he created for us. So just as a proud father would be of presenting his daughter on their wedding, that's the mentality or the idea in Revelation 21, that the New Jerusalem is like a bride, beautifully adorned for her husband. So she's being presented to all believers of all time. Verse 10, and he says, and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. There's the reference to mountains in heaven. It's physical. It's not on clouds. It's on a mountain. And so a lot of, so you have the eternal mountains that, that are there. So John sees this and he says, and he showed me a great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. The idea of the holy Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, the earthly Jerusalem was kind of patterned off of, and the new Jerusalem is coming out of heaven showing its divine origin, that God did this. It's not humanly created. And one of the things you're going to see in the next slide is it's cubical. It's a massive cube, and we'll talk about this a little bit. But remember, it's the Holy of Holies. It's the, the Gadesh HaKodeshim, the Holy of Holies, and it's showing you it's a massive Holy of Holies. And guess what? In that Holy of Holies, where the priest could only go once a year, you and I will dwell permanently in the presence of Messiah, in the presence of the triune God. It's sending that message. Let me show you a video real quick just to kind of get the conception of the Holy of Holies in the New Jerusalem and the size and immensity of it. Go ahead and roll that video. And I saw a new heaven, and a new earth. For the first heaven, and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God, out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned, for her husband. And I heard a great voice, out of heaven, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God, is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be 
his people. And God himself shall be with them, and be, their God. And God, shall wipe away, all tears, from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things, are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true, and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who thirsts, I will give of the fountain, of the water of life, freely. He, who overcomes, will inherit all things, and I will be, his God. And he will be, my son. And he carried me away, in the spirit, to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven, from God, having the glory of God, and its light, was like a stone, most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear, as crystal, and, it had a great, and high wall, with twelve gates, and on the gates, were twelve angels, and having names inscribed, which are the names of the twelve tribes, of the sons of Israel. And the wall of the city, had twelve foundations, and in them were the names of the twelve apostles, of the Lamb. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Respectively, each one of the gates was one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold. As transparent glass, the river of the water of life, sparkling like crystal, and coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb, and flowing down the middle, of the city's street. On each side of the river was the tree of life, which bears fruit twelve times a year, once each month, and its leaves, are for the healing, of the nations. And the city had no need of the sun, nor of the moon, that they might shine, in it. For the glory of God, illuminated it, and its lamp, is the Lamb. And the nations, of those who are saved, will walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth, bring their glory and honor, into it. But nothing that is impure, will enter the city nor anyone who does shameful things or tells lies. Only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of the Living, will enter the city. The throne of God, and of the Lamb, shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face. Listen, says Jesus, I am coming soon. I, will bring, my rewards with me. To give to each one according, to what he has done. I am the first and the last, the beginning, and the end. Happy are those, who wash their robes clean. And so have the right, to eat the fruit from the tree, of life. And to go through the gates, into, the city. 
Well, with that in mind, you get a good concept of it. So now let's drill down and specifically in what these passages mean and the spiritual message that's behind it. So let's go to verse 11a. And it says that this place having the glory of God. Now that's important to understand. What it's referring to, the glory, it's, is the Shekinah glory. Now, you think, what does this have to do with security? Well, because you're in the Holy of Holies, remember, no average Israeli could go into the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest could go in the Holy of Holies once a year with blood. And if he didn't, he's dead. And you had occasions in the Old Testament where guys would get, you know, they would touch the ark. And one time it was getting ready to fall over and they would touch the ark and it killed them. And one of the themes throughout the Old Testament, and it's carried through the New Testament, is if you see God in his glory, it will kill you. That's why Moses was put into a cleft of a rock and he could only see the trail behind God because Moses asked to see his glory and God didn't allow it because it would kill us in our flesh, in our sin nature. If we saw the glory of God, it would literally kill us. We couldn't stand it. And so part of this thing about security is this. In this state with a new body and without the sin nature, we now can enter into the Holy of Holies and actually see God's Shekinah glory and it not kill us. So he's saying you're safe now, even from the Shekinah glory. And so the glory is seen in all of this place because it is a massive Holy of Holies. And it says, her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. The idea of a jasper stone, it's kind of, uh, it's our diamond. And it's a diamond-like appearance, clear. And what it's doing is showing that, that the stones, the jewels that are there, are meant to reflect and refract the Shekinah glory light as it permeates the entire atmosphere of the place. Now you think, what is that about? Well, it means that there's no shadows. It means that there's not a square inch of darkness ever there because the diamonds and the, all the jewels are reflect, reflecting the Shekinah glory all over the place. That's important. That's a message. That's a theological message. It is real. But in the realness of it, it's sending a message. No shadows. No darkness. That's a theme carried all through the Bible between light and darkness. John will pick up the theme in the Gospel of John. This theme of light and darkness. And the idea is, the messaging is this. There's no sin here. There's no evil here. There is no shadow where people are doing things behind the scenes that we don't know about. Like what's going on in our culture and what's going on in the world. There's no one doing backroom deals where no one sees. Everything is in the light. This is where the term walk in the light comes from. To not walk in the light means to walk in darkness. Unbelievers can do it and even believers can walk in darkness. So it shows you that this place is messaging there is no sin, evil here because this is the Holy of Holies. The Shekinah is throwing light everywhere. Verse 12. Also, she had a great and high wall. Interesting. Why have a wall in heaven? Isn't that interesting? There's a wall. What are walls for? Well, in the ancient world, walls kept the wrong people out. It kept it from military invasion. In the ancient world, every city you see archaeologically will have walls. These are the walls of the old city of Jerusalem. And they surround the old city. And again, you know, you have to go down deep to get to first century walls. But they're there. And even in a town or a city like Jerusalem, they still have walls today. If you look archaeologically, almost every ancient ruins in the Mesopotamian area had walls around it. What did Jericho have around it? Walls, right? Everything had walls. Walls were to keep the wrong people from entering. And that's the message. The message in it is this place keeps the wrong people that shouldn't be here out. The gospel is exclusive. You only get to get into salvation or the new Jerusalem 
via Jesus Christ. Anyone trying to bust their way through, the wall keeps them out per se. Do you see how secure this place is? It's a place of security. It's a fortress that keeps bad, evil out. That very thing our heart longs for, that security of being protected from evildoers. I mean, think about this. When you walk now into certain places in Bakersfield at the wrong time of the day, you sometimes have to look over your shoulder. I mean, I'm now looking on Rosedale, and there, there's so many weirdos walking on Rosedale. I'm thinking, man, am I going to get mugged? I was at Walmart the other night, and I'm thinking, there's all kinds of weirdos walking around. And they weren't shopping. They were looking for cars to break into. And I'm thinking, you know what? i got to live like that? And now if you have a baby in a hospital, boy, there's all this security. In the most precious moment of your life, having a child... The first thing they will come and do is put put, uh, things on their wrists and trackers because what are they afraid of? Someone stealing your baby. That's what they're afraid of. Do you see that every precious moment that you have, the birth of a child has to be disrupted because we're afraid someone will do something bad to us. Think about that. I have to be afraid of someone stealing my baby. We used to live in an environment in America where you let the kids play outside until night, come home when the lights went dark. Remember that? Amen. You can't do that anymore. Because you know across the street you have a pedophiler, and then you have a, a, a sexual pervert two blocks away because Megan Law tells you where all these people are at. And you walk through this life more fearful because of evil doers, evil people. In the New Jerusalem, that's gone. The thought of even having to protect yourself is now vanished. You don't have to think about a burglar or someone jumping you. It's amazing. We just get used to living like this, don't we? We get used, and it's just, you can't do it. God gives us the security. He's saying, you can have it now. I'm your security. But let me do a a, a theological typology here real quick. You see these walls. The New Jerusalem has walls. But Eden didn't. Remember that? It was a wall-less garden temple. But New Jerusalem has a wall. And because it was wall-less, who came in the garden? You got it? You see how God is messaging to us that this environment is different than the garden. The garden caused all the problems. It was wall-less. Now, Adam should have did his duty and defend it, but it was wall-less, which means intruders could come in. And an intruder came in, the highest of the cherubim that had fallen, and tempted our parents. It was wall-less. And God is saying, not happening anymore. I'm putting a wall around it. That's the theological message he's sending us. You're protected. It's not going to happen again. Sin will never enter into your environment anymore. And notice it says it had 12 gates. Let's go back to the text real quick. With 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates, standing at centuries, as centuries. But remember, angels in this environment serve us. See, there are ministering angels. And according to Hebrews, when we're there, they actually serve us. They're there to minister to us we will actually rank higher than angels in the New Jerusalem. They will be our servants. Isn't that an amazing thought? So they're there at the gates waiting for us to give them the commands, waiting for God to give them the command, but we outrank them. And they're there to to minister to our needs, whatever they are. And it says, and the names written on them, talking about the gates, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Let that sink in. Why? Because the church in modern days refuses to acknowledge that God has a plan for Israel. This is a very pro-Israel place, by the way. Okay? It has the names of the 12 tribes on it, for goodness sake. For all eternity, the names of the 12 tribes. And yet so many Christians want to just denounce Israel and treat her bad be anti-Semitic. For most of church history, I can tell you this, if you study church history, many of the church fathers were completely anti-Semitic. God's done with the Jews. They call them Christ killers. 
And that ends up leading to the Holocaust in Nazi Germany. Hitler just used the words of Martin Luther and all the people before him to say, hey, I don't, I'm not saying anything different than what your religious teachers taught. You have to understand that anti-Semitism started early on in the church. I mean real early. Like in the hundreds. Right after the apostles died, anti-Semitism ends up in there. And we have a dreaded theology called replacement theology that's messed up a lot of churches. But the New Jerusalem is saying, Israel's important. I'm using Israel in my plan of salvation. How so? Why is Israel's names at the gates? They're at the gates. Gates symbolize things in the ancient world. We have some pictures there. Here's some pictures in Jerusalem of the gates. I think this is the gate of Damascus in Jerusalem. I think we have a couple more. This is the Jaffa gate. And then this is the eastern gate or the golden gate around Jerusalem. Now, the gates are named for where they pointed to. They pointed out. So if, if, if it's the Damascus gate, the gate points to Damascus. If it's a Jaffa gate, it points to Jaffa. And the eastern gate points east. And that's the gate the Messiah will come in. Well, nonetheless, gates are important in the ancient world. In most ancient cities, you had one entrance. Okay, This one has 12. Okay. But you had one entrance, and you had to go through that city through that one entrance, and the people in the city gate made sure who came in and out of that city. If you were not a resident, you would be questioned about what are you doing here. And so there was always a check of who's going inside. Now, if you go to this New Jerusalem, at every gate is the name of one of the 12 tribes of Israel. The passageway in here is saying this salvation of why you're here goes through Israel. How so? Well, Paul will mention this in Romans. He'll say, we have every right to be indebted to the Jews, us Gentiles. And why? He says, because, number one, they're the ones who preserved the scriptures. They're the ones who gave us the prophets. They're the ones who saw the glory. They're the ones who have all the promises made to them. They're the ones, and here it is, that gave us the Messiah. And hence, Paul will, in Romans 15, say we are indebted to the Jews for what they gave us. Because salvation is of the Jews. And you'll never get away from that. All eternity speaks of Israel's influence. Yeah, we know Israel would go astray and do crazy things and worship foreign gods, but that was the non-remnant. The remnant of Israel always held. The remnant of Israel might have gotten really small, but it was always there. And God used that remnant to eventually bring the Messiah to planet Earth and become salvation for us Gentiles. Forever, as we enter the gates, will we be reminded of Israel's instrumentality even in our own salvation. So much so that the Apostle Paul, check this out, says us Gentiles should give money to save believers, a Jews. That there should be an element in your own personal giving that you're actually giving to saved Jews. Whether that's Jews for Jesus, Chosen People Ministry, Minno Kalisha in Jerusalem, or, or wherever. Even our church gives back our money to Jewish organizations who are getting the gospel out to Jewish people. And Paul says you're indebted to them, so therefore financially, if they give you spiritually, you must give them financially back because you're indebted to them. That will never be taught in most churches. Because you know what most churches are going to say? You need to give to the storehouse, and this is 10%, and blah, blah, blah. And you're like, oh, that's crazy talk. You have no idea about giving. The Holy Spirit will prompt you, if you're listening to him, to give to Jewish organizations because you're indebted to them. And the gates are signaling that. The gates are saying salvation is of the Jews. Messiah is Jewish. You know that certain Christians don't know Jesus is Jewish? I know that sounds crazy, doesn't it? They think he's just some Gentile God. No, 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 he's Jewish. 
His name is Yeshua, not Jesus. It's Yeshua. We've Gentilized him, but he's extremely Jewish. And yet, we have people just clueless about this. Now, let's move on. In verse 13, it says, three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. Again, this is very pro-Israel. Do you know what that arrangement is? It's a reminder of something that happened in the past. The way the tribes are organized in the New Jerusalem is the exact same way they were organized in the wilderness with Moses. Look at this. You had four main divisions based on the Levitical, Levitical priests surrounding the tabernacle in the wilderness. These are based on the calculations and numbers according to the people. And again, they were according to the tribe of Levi, they would spread out. If you were to go back in time and take a helicopter over where Israel was at in the desert, this would have been the aerial view you would have saw. What's the messaging? Do you see the message? The way the camps are aligned is making a cross. That's amazing. You can't dream that stuff up. If you do the calculations, that's the camp you will see in the desert. As Balaam was trying to curse Israel, they would have seen that configuration out in the desert, a giant cross of people. Amazing. And yet the New Jerusalem continues that messaging and says he organizes the camps in that message so that dissecting the New Jerusalem is the cross. Right on top of it, man. It's amazing. It's amazing all the symbolism there. Verse 14. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Again, a perpetual reminder of the church's role. So you have the perpetual reminder of Israel's role in salvation. Now on the foundations of the city is a perpetual reminder of the church's role. Now notice that the names that are on the foundations are the 12 apostles. Really, we would say 13 because in, we say 12 tribes, but it's really 13 tribes. Did you know that? You don't count usually one of the tribes, which is the tribe of Levi. And so there's actually 13 tribes, and there's 13 apostles. Do you know which the 13 is? It's Paul. He's an apostle to the Gentiles. So as Israel had 13, then the church has 13 apostles. But we always say 12, okay? That's just the nomenclature we always go by. But anyway, the names of the apostles are on there, on the foundation. Now we know why the apostle Paul will say this. In 1 Corinthians 3, he says, it is us apostles who lay the foundation of the church, and that foundation, he says, is Messiah. And he says, you must then, and I'm paraphrasing, build upon this foundation of the Messiah, because it, as a believer, if you do not you will lose rewards. And he says, some will get to heaven and have the smell of smoke on them, so to speak. They will have their entry ticket, but they will not have any rewards. And that's funny. He made an argumentation based on the foundation of the Messiah and said, if you don't build on this and you build with wood, hay, and stubble, you won't be rewarded. That wood and hay and stubble will be burned up. Now, what's the messaging in this? Brilliant. Only God could inspire this, by the way. It's so interconnected with other passages. It just blows me away. Okay, follow me. Messiah, at the confession of the Messiah in Matthew 16, when Peter says, you are the son of God, the Messiah. Remember that. And Jesus says, upon this rock, I will build my church. The foundation. Not Peter. That's the Roman Catholic nonsense. The rock is the confession of who Jesus is, the rock. The information about Messiah is the rock and the foundation. Hence, it's the foundation in the New Jerusalem, symbolizing this. Okay, so Jesus, Jesus as the Messiah, Yahweh God, is the foundation. 
Then to segue over, Paul goes further and he says, yes, and he's the foundation and we must build our life upon that foundation. And the way you build on it will be determined at the Bema Seat of Christ. He goes, some believers will build with human works, wood, hay, and stubble. Some other believers will build with gems. He uses gold and silver and precious stones, right? Why is Paul using precious stones and then wood, hay, and stubble? Because the precious stones are linked to the new Jerusalem. The whole city is a precious stone. Because you know why the theme is? Precious stones are not man-made. This is why even when Israel built things, they built it out of stone. They would carve the stone, but they didn't use bricks. Bricks are man-made. Stones are what God gives, and then they shape it and form it. Jewels, like gold, silver, topaz, all this are created from God and therefore represent only God's works. Whereas wood, hay, and stubble is representative of man's works. What's the takeaway? The takeaway is this. Only gemstones that you build in your life make it there. Because there's no wood, hay, and stubble there. It's only gemstones. And hence, in order to have those gemstones, you must then build your life on the foundation of the Messiah. What do you mean? Well, a lot of times Christians put good things as the priority of their life. And they get mistaken. For instance, if you put your family as your foundation and you build on your family as a foundation, that's wood, hay, and stubble. It's not Jesus. If you build on your marriage as the foundation of your life, it's wood, hay, and stubble. If you build on your church or some type of ministry that you do, and this is your hobby horse, and you use that ministry as your foundation, it's wood, hay, and stubble. Why? Because you're not building on the right foundation. You must have Jesus as the foundation for your ministry, for your marriage, for your family. And if it's not in the right order, everything will be burned up. There's no jewels left. That's the idea. Only jewels will make it through the fire or make it through the judgment. And so, hence, it, it, it's a, a perfect teaching lesson about Jesus being the foundation that you must build on it. So you have Israel, and then you have the church being instrumental with the Messiah. The church explained the rest of the story about Messiah. The Old Testament predicted it, and then the New Testament enfolds it. So it's a perfect complement to each other, Israel and the church. Notice the number 12 pops up all over the place. Have you seen that? 12 gates, 12 angels, 12 foundations. 12 symbolizes in gematria, in Hebrew alphanumeric systems, 12 symbolizes a completeness in terms of God's administration and his subdivisions in the corporate whole. I know that's a mouthful, but that's what gematria means as far as the number 12. Governmental administration, God's administration, breaking up into subdivisions of a corporate whole. Now you think, well, what is the big deal about that? Well, if the people of this world would realize, this is important, that you have to have governmental subdivisions in your government, it would prevent a bureaucracy. If we did our government the way God designs his government, 12 tribes, 12 everywhere, it's 12, we wouldn't have the governmental problems of wanting to be a one-world government because what he's showing is the government I have, I give local control to the individuals of the corporate. So there's 12 controls. Like, for instance, the tribes of Israel will get 12 allotted lands. It won't be a corporate land. It'll be, this is for Judah, this is for Benjamin, and he will go down. And what it shows you is God is showing you this is how government runs. And if one day I'm going to run the government myself, and this is what I will do. There will be subdivisions in the government and rulers and princes and governors who rule local areas under my direction. It's a perfect form of government. And yet, 
our people, what do they want? They want a one world government where you have this massive bureaucracy, no, no local control, that all the control is at the top. And that's the problem. And yet God says, I'm going to one day do away with it and make a new government. Verse 15. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates and its walls. What is he doing? Showing that all of it belongs to God. Now jump with me to verse 17 and 18 because he's going to talk about these walls. Then he measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to the measure of man, that is of an angel. And basically what you're getting is a wall. Let me show you a picture. You see the people on the bottom of that? That is per se rock in Canada. That's 216 feet. That's how big the walls are. And you can see the humans on the bottom. That's how big the wall that encircles New Jerusalem is. Here's another picture. This is Tauhannock Falls in uh, New York. And this is, you can see the, the fall is 216 feet. That's how high the wall is in the New Jerusalem. Anyway, in verse 18, it says this. The construction of its wall was of jasper. Again, that's our, our diamond. And the city was pure gold, like clear glass. So the wall is this translucent, diamond-like appearance with the hue of gold in it. We've never seen transparent gold, but it is. Okay, so what's, what's the wall for? The wall is for protection. That's the messaging. It's to keep people out that don't belong. The only people that get in there are believers, And so that's the takeaway that you get from this. That's what God is wanting to say is, this is a place of security that I'm not allowing the wrong people to enter. Even fallen angels will not be able to enter. Did you know that Satan still has access to the third abode? He still has an audience with God. He still can talk with God. We know what he's doing right now. He's accusing the brethren. And we see that with Job chapter 1, that Satan can go before God, so can demons. And, and so, but they cannot enter the new Jerusalem. It is forbidden. And so the walls is to tell you and I, I'm keeping them out. It's a safe place of security. Now let's apply this. Right now, if you listen to the mantra out in the world, they're crying for peace and security or peace and safety which was predicted by Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, that before the end comes and the tribulation comes, people will be crying out for peace and safety or peace and security. So everybody wants security. That's the mantra today. And boy, howdy, they're willing to give away their freedoms for it, aren't they? What you will see in our world today is because people don't trust God for their security. They trust themselves. They trust the government for security. They will give up freedoms for security. How so? Well, right now, what they're developing now is facial recognition. Have you seen this thing? It's called Morris, the Mobile Offender Registration Information System. I got to experience this when I took a plane. When we went to Israel, we flew out of LAX, and we were on Air France, and we, we, we would hit Paris and then hit to Tel Aviv. When I boarded, they didn't ask for my passport or ID. You know what they did? They said, look here. And the camera identified me. And I'm thinking, is someone watching me, man? That's kind of freaky. That I don't need to give you my passport. I don't need to give you any driver's license. or any, You can just tell who I am by the camera and the picture. Yeah, because of facial recognition. And people say, hey, man, that's an invasion of privacy, man. I don't want my picture being used by people. And they say, we don't care because we'll give you security. So what are you afraid of if you're doing something wrong? What, you know, are you afraid of something? And well, no, but I'm losing my freedoms because someone's watching me on camera. They're using this camera in China, by the way, for social tracking. They're doing this now. So we see in the world that people are saying, they say, well, I like that. I think that's a great idea. And I say, you know what? Let's just go hog wild. Put a chip right here and put a chip in your hand. And we won't have to deal with this at all. You don't have to carry a wallet or anything. They go, oh, man, that's a great idea. (laughs) Yeah, I think it's written somewhere in the Bible. They have no clue. They don't know what I'm talking about. But the idea is they were willing to give up freedoms for security. Okay, now we get personal. Christians are willing to give up their spiritual freedoms for security. And it's not security coming from God. 
See, you can have this security, this message of security, you can have it now. You can have it now. And it is available to you in the abundant life. But you have to believe. Well, yeah, Brandon, I, I, I believe that God is my security and God is my source of protection. I believe it, do you? Because this is a hard one, man. I struggle with it. What do you mean? Well, you have to really be honest with yourself. And that's hard to do sometimes because we're in denial. And I can get myself in denial and think, well, I'm just rolling. I'm fine. I believe, yeah, I believe God's secure for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then I watch what I'm doing. And what I do doesn't match what I say I believe. What do you mean? Well, things kind of freak me out. Things kind of make me afraid. When I see things go happening, and I monitor what's happening constantly. And, uh, you know, then I, 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 I can get into this mode of thinking, oh, wow, it's going to get really bad, and I better bunker in. And I better have my ducks in a row and this and that. And, and, you, and when I start realizing, I can never get my ducks in a row. I don't know about you. I can't get my ducks in a row. If you get them in a row, I'm going to give you, a, you know, a, an award. But I can't ever get my ducks in a row. I'm always playing catch-up with what I should be doing, per se, as far as providing myself security. I'm behind, you know, on retirement. I'm behind here. I'm behind there. You know, and you're like, oh, man, you know, yeah, I, I need that, but I can't do that right now. What's happening to me is that I'm starting to, you start to lose faith in God's bringing security to you. And then he constantly reminds me of this. And you know people play this game. You know, they become fanatical about something and say, well, you know, Brandon, I got to save for retirement. I got to save my pennies and you never know that rainy day. You're right. Absolutely. But here's the deal. It's just like the lady I talked to you before. There's no doubt you can walk out of here and someone attack you. But can you live that way in fear constantly? If you do, you will go paranoid. You just get paranoid of everything. And there's that line. And I see this a lot of people. And you know this with hoarders. Have you ever seen a hoarder? You look at the place and you're like, oh man, how do you function? There's food left all over the place. There's boxes. There's trash everywhere. But it is what it is. But you have to know the psychology. You have to know the mentality. Why do people hoard? You ever seen those shows? They won't tell you because they don't want to psychoanalyze these people, but really what's happening is they're afraid. And they had something early in life taken away from them or they had trauma or they didn't get something. And so what ends up happening is they start hoarding things to make them feel secure. If they have enough of something, food or whatever it is, appliances, whatever, okay, I feel good. I feel good. It's a counterfeit. It's a counterfeit to real security, but that's what hoarding's doing. And then what happens if they do it long enough, they actually go mental, and they, you can't bring them back. They just go paranoid, and you can't ever bring them back. That's the idea of hoarding. But it all starts with, I'm afraid. I'm afraid someone's going to take something from me. I'm afraid someone's going to do something to me like they did before, and it starts with fear. But here's the deal. I could really get down on someone hoarding food or hoarding their, you know, stuff around the house, but you start thinking about it. Wait a second. Back up. Let me think about the principle of hoarding. Why? Because I can make the same argument for those who hoard money. You know, well, it's not as dirty as that. Right? I know they have their bank accounts, but they're hoarding money. That's like Ebenezer Scrooge, right? He's hoarding money, counting how many coal uh, Cratchit's putting into the, the fireplace, and they're millionaires. Hey, dude. How much is enough? One more dollar, as Rockefeller said. One more dollar. And people start hoarding money. And here's the the crux of the matter. Have you do you know millionaires that pretend to be poor? I see it all the time. You know what? That's in the book of Proverbs. He says, Those who are rich will pretend to be poor, and those who are poor will pretend to be rich. I see the same thing playing out in life. But what's happening is these these very wealthy people start they, they convince themselves. I'm poor, I'm poor, I'm poor. And they keep believing that lie and they amass masses of amounts of wealth. But really what they're doing is the same thing as the woman hoarding stuff in her house. They're hoarding money. Jesus gave a parable about this. Do you remember the parable? There was a guy who just kept building his barns bigger and filling them with grain. Do you remember that? And he goes, sit back, soul, and rest. Uh, Keep building my bigger barns. And what he was doing is basking in security of his money. And Jesus said to what to that guy? You fool. 
This very night, your life will be demanded of you. All your money is not going to prevent death from coming to you. And where will this all end? And then he ends, you know, he'll say things in other parables like, this is what happens to people who are not generous towards God. They're hoarding money. And it happens to a lot of people. Or how about people who start hoarding possessions? They can't get enough of some object. You say, well, it's my little hobby. This is my hobby, and this is kind of the way of my outlet. Yeah, how much is enough, dude? 20, 30, 50, 100? How much is enough? I watch these guys on these shows where they go out and they buy junk from yard sales and stuff like that, and they go to these people's homes like in North Carolina and South Carolina. Have you seen this? And they got acres of junk. I mean, acres. I mean, going back to the 1900s, and they have five of them, each one of them. And they won't give them up. They won't sell it to the guy. Oh, I don't want to part with that. I don't want to, it's just sentimentality. What are you, crazy? If you were in California and you had all that junk in your backyard and you were up north or down south where the wildfires went, guess what happened to your junk? Gone. You can save up all you want, but it's be gone in one, one day in a fire. Oh, don't stay like that, Brandon. That scares me even more. Well, if that scares you, then you're paranoid. How about this? This is something else. One more thing. People start hoarding themselves. What? Yeah, they start hoarding themselves. Explain that one. Because they had stuff happen to them in the past, they're afraid of people. Not so much that they're going to do anything wrong to another person. They're afraid of other people finding out about them. They can't be transparent. And so what they end up doing is they isolate and withdraw, and they actually start hoarding themselves. They won't give themselves to anybody. They just keep themselves to themselves. And they isolate and move themselves out of fellowship and refuse to engage in anyone on an interpersonal level. Have you ran into a person like that? They can't even empathize or sympathize. They refuse to do that. They keep so much distance. And that's called hoarding yourself. You're supposed to give yourself to people. You're supposed to be transparent. You're supposed to, but hey, I'm going to be rejected, Brandon. I'm not going to do that. And so that's why they start isolating. And you think, wow, that's crazy. Yeah, but I know, but what's happening? They lack the belief that God is security for them. So for them, security is withdrawing, being safe. There's no safety in this world, and you have to come to grips with that. And you're going to have to do an exchange. Because every time I get into that mode, I have to do the exchange. And what's the exchange? I must give up my sugar sticks of relying on temporary security, whether that's my bank account, whether that's my retirement, whatever it is, and I have to give that up and transfer it to the security of God. I have to constantly remind myself. Otherwise, I get into that weird mode and I start freaking out about the future. And that's what happens. So you have to keep telling yourself, I must go ahead and feel vulnerable to transfer that security to God. That's what the message is about the new Jerusalem. This is a place of security, but the security can happen right now in our relationship with Messiah.